L. Okay. Um, Got it. Okay. Can you please skip this slide? Right. I think we already spent like 10 minutes on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I went over this one too. And then devices. So for devices, what uh, Bioprocess Lab is going to ask you is due to um, usually the lack of devices in schools, like they don't have like all these fancy devices. If you're taking an online test, they're going to show you photos of this device to uh, ask you what, what is the name of this and what it does. Or um, if you're in person, they're probably gonna show you the actual device. Uh, for this one, you should also know how to use microscopes because they may ask you to look at something under a microscope or identify parts of a microscope. That's basically all you need to know for that section. So now we're gonna move on to webs and diagrams. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, they will also ask you to label microscopes a lot. It's good to have a label diagram of a microscope on your uh, cheat sheet because it's uh, very useful information and almost nobody can remember the names. So food webs. A food web is a chain of, is a system of food chains in an ecosystem. And there's different trophic levels in a food chain. About 10% of the energy gets passed between each trophic level. And um, the next two vocabulary terms, bioaccumulation and bio, uh, biomagnification, um, refer to toxins entering the food web through individual organisms and then passing between trophic levels and increasing in concentration in the food web. Yeah, Bioprocess Lab, actually, I believe it overlaps with a lot of other um, events because Bioprocess Lab is basically just um, beginner intro to biology. Autotrophs produce their own food. Heterotrophs con uh, consume other organisms. And between these, um, there are herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, detritivores, and decomposers. All right, next we have karyotype charts. Usually what a question is going to ask you is they're going to show you a chart and it's going to have some sort of defect in it. A karyotype chart is a chart that uh, shows all 23 chromosomes, including X and Y chromosomes. And um, they show you this chart and they ask you, a, a person has these chromosomes, what uh, disorders do they have? So you have to be able to analyze genetic disorders from karyotype charts. Three of the most important ones that show up a lot are Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, and Kleinfelter syndrome described on the sheets. So it'd be a good idea to write those down. Um, yeah, uh, a boy is, uh, males are XY chromosomes and females have XX. All right, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, okay, and then the next are interactions. Sometimes they give you a description of an interaction and ask you, what is it called when like, let's say, these, um, this organism, let's say some sort of plant feeds off a tree. And you're going to go through it and say, oh, it's detrimental to the tree and it's good for the plant. It benefits one and um, it's detrimental to the other organism. So you would say, oh, that's parasitism. And um, these are pretty easy to write down in your cheat sheet. So I would suggest that you have this too. Um, please take either a screenshot or notes of this slide and we're gonna move on to the next one. All right, so now we're going to go through the basics of cellular transport. The cell membrane is a semi-permeable membrane surrounding the surface of a cell. All cells have to maintain, all cells have a limit to how big they can be. This is because um, cells um, have to maintain a certain, like a maximum or minimum, but um, they have to make sure they have enough surface area for the volume of the cell because while the cell can produce things inside of it. It also has to be able to export and import materials across the cell membrane. And if the cell membrane's surface area is too small, they won't be able to do that. This is why cells can't be infinitely large. The cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer and it, we often call it a fluid mosaic model. This is because there are different components across the cell membrane. 
that give it fluidity. Um, something that showed up on two of my bioprocess lab tests is cholesterol. It regulates the fluidity of the membrane under different temperatures. I don't know why they like to test it so much, but it's on a lot of tests. Yeah, for the big cells aren't useful in the body because they can't get enough materials imported and export proteins and stuff. All right, can we move on to the next page? All right, so now we're going to go through types of cellular transport across the cell, cell membrane. There are two types of transport, passive transport and active transport. Passive transport does not require energy and you find it in methods like diffusion, uh, osmosis and facilitated diffusion and active transport, which requires an energy. Some examples are ion pumps and um, there's different types of active transport too. There's endocytosis is the cellular membrane taking in matter and exocytosis, which is the cellular membrane releasing matter, moving matter from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. When the, um, there are two types of endocytosis too. It's called phagocytosis and pinocytosis. And you don't really need to know these in detail for the bioprocess lab exam. All right, now we're going to go over the types of passive transport. Okay, thank you. Diffusion is the movement of particles across a selectively permeable cell membrane without using any energy. This is driven by the concentration gradient and um, the cell membrane will try to achieve dynamic equilibrium. This is when they want the same amount, well, almost same amount of solute on both sides. This usually works for small and nonpolar particles because it's easier for them to get across the cell membrane without any help. Um, there's three terms you need to know, hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic solutions. These are solutions. Um, this, these are describing the amount of the solute within both sides. Um, hypertonic is what is the solution with a higher concentration of solute. Hypotonic is a solution with a lower concentration of solute, and isotonic solutions are solutions where the concentration of the solute is equivalent on both sides. All right, another form of passive transport is osmosis. It's the diffusion of water through the semi-permeable uh, semi membrane or cellular membrane. Basically, this is just taking the idea of diffusion, but instead of moving the solute across the cellular, cellular membrane, you're moving the water across the cellular membrane to get the same concentration on both sides by adding more water to one side and removing it from the other. Um, facilitated diffusion is molecules going through protein channels, and this works for small and polar particles. All right. So next, we're going to go through the basics of cells. And what you need to know for this part is what each part of the cell does. And um, yeah, these are basics you should know for bioprocess lab. They're usually indirectly tested. All right, so first of all, we're going to go over the prokaryotic cell. The prokaryotic cell is a type of cell that does not have a nucleus and membrane-bound particles, organelles, sorry, not particles. Um, these only contain free ribosomes, which are ribosomes that are not connected to an endoplasmic reticulum, which make proteins for use within the cell. Usually bound ribosomes, which are ribosomes connected to rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, make proteins for use that are exported outside of the cell. It does not have a nucleus. Instead, it has a nucleoid region where all of the DNA is. There is a cell wall present and some examples include bacteria and archaea cells. Okay, next up we have the eukaryotic cell. This um, diagram right here I have on the left is of an animal cell. And the next slide contains a plant cell, but we're not there yet. Yes we have eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are cells that have membrane-bound organelles and a nucleus. They contain both free and bound ribosomes and a nucleus. 
So it also has structure. You can uh, find this from microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments. Uh, animal cells contain centrioles. Plant cells do not. All right. Uh, they're the things, the white things, that are colored yellow on most diagrams, and they look kind of like corn when that happens. So like, yeah, that's centrioles. All right, can we move on to the next slide? All right, this is a diagram of a plant cell. Um, plant cells contain vacuoles, <laughs> vacuoles, a chloroplast, and a cell wall, all of which animal cells do not. All right. Is this from the cells wrap? No, I, um, I don't know what that is, but it sounds cool. The only wrap I know is the um, amendment wrap I was forced to learn. All right, so on the next slide, on the next slide, I have a gigantic chart of different parts of the cell, where they're, which cells they're found in and um, what they do. It's a good idea to take a screenshot of this because I don't think we're going to be on this slide for very long, but we're gonna go over this very quickly. I already mentioned the cell membrane. The cytoplasm is all fluid in the cell, not including the nucleus. The nucleus we've already went over, and so did uh, the nucleolus is where the ribosome production begins. Um, ribosomes make proteins, which are then sent to the Golgi system. Yeah, the endo there's two types of endoplasmic reticulums. The rough ER transports proteins, the smooth ER transports lipids and breaks down some stuff. The Golgi complex modifies proteins. Lysosomes break down cellular garbage. And um, yeah, the rest of them, basically all of these are, can be explained by the description on it. And okay. Yeah, so take a screenshot if you haven't already of this slide, please. All right, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to be going through DNA, I don't think I have a lot of information for this section. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I don't have a lot of information for this section on the slides. So uh, I'm just going to go talk about it. Um, I don't believe I'm going over transcription and translation but there are a lot of videos on YouTube that explain it really well, probably better than I can explain it. Um, this is the basic structure of a chromosome. You've seen it before in the karyotype charts. Yeah, um, I think that's about it for this section that I have here. I do have notes on transcription and translation. If you guys would like to see that, I'll send that during break. However, this is uh, usually not tested during the um, bioprocess lab. Too much. Um, I remember it was tested once. It was, it was um, giving a diagram and asking you to like label the different parts of the chromosome. All right, so yeah, patent, uh, that's covered later. Um, we're just going to pause here. I think it would be useful to have a small summary on transcription and translation. So we're gonna go over that really quickly. Uh, your genetic information is stored in DNA. Translation is the process in which DNA is used to make proteins in ribosomes. Transcription is the synthesis of the DNA. The DNA never interacts directly with the ribosomes. There's courier RNA to um, go between them. All right, so I'm gonna go transcription. Transcription is a synthesis of RNA from a specific strand of DNA. The DNA template strand allows the synthesis of RNA via a base pairing. 
and that would good be a good time to mention. Um, for this section, they may give you, um, I believe the most, the biggest part of it is they give you a strand of DNA, ask you to say what is the, um, what would it look like if it were converted into RNA? And um, what is the, like the matching RNA with this? And then it asks you to identify the codons and anticodons. That can be done using a chart. We're not gonna go over that today. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the basic summary of transcription and translation. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, Daniel, what is the difference between DNA and RNA? DNA is a, has a double helix structure, which is like the thing you see on all of the, it's like, oh, this is DNA. It looks like it has a wavy thingy with like, let me see if I can draw it. Hmm. Okay, I don't think I can annotate on this. That's fine. Um, yeah, RNA only has a single helix. And also it doesn't have a T, which is, uh, I forgot what it stands for. It doesn't have a uh, thymine. Thym thym <sighs> yeah, all right, we're moving on to the next section. Okay, so we're going to go over ATP and glucose. ATP and glucose are the two largest forms of energy currency in the cell. So first of all, we're going to, oh my God. First of all, we're going to go into photosynthesis. Photosynthesis converts ATP into glucose. The equation is H2O, water plus CO2, carbon dioxide, becomes glucose and oxygen. Um, you should know that equation pretty well. So we're going to watch the video after I go through this because it explains this really well. And right now my stuff is really short. Photosynthesis has two stages, the light dependent stage and the light independent stage. The light dependent stage um, the requires light, ener light energy and water and it releases oxygen. And light independent stage requires carbon dioxide and energy and produces ATP and it re uh, recycles G3P. Carbon fixation is the conversion of light into chemical energy. All right, uh, could you click on the video? I'm not sure if you can access it from there, but um, it would be good if we could show the video. Um, if not, I can copy and no, I cannot copy and paste the link, but I, I can put it into the chat. Wait, hello. Oh, do you want me to play it with sound? Oh, uh, yeah, that would be good. All right. Um, then I have. They might have to restart the share. Oh, okay. Um, um the link to this video, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Share sound. Oh yeah, that's it. Share here. Here. That should be the correct link, but I typed it by hand, so. In I order for plants to grow, they need inputs of carbon dioxide, water, and energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. <laughs> The energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles, or photons, are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path which is measured as wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths, called the electromagnetic spectrum. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments 
and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur Okay, sorry. We are running a bit over time, so we got to go fast, and that means we probably need to um, stop the video here. Um, if you're interested, you can check this video out during the break. I'm sure it's going to be super useful, and yeah, back to the um, slides. Can you, like, play the video during break? Could you say that again? I did not hear that. Can you play the video during the break? Oh, that, that's a good idea. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, I have good news and bad news. So we're at currently on slide 23. That's the bad news. And the good news is that instead of 40 slides, I realized I have actually only 32 and then a bunch of extra resources. So that's good. Okay. Oh, never mind. We're on slide 21. Okay. Could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So now we're going to go over the cellular respiration. If you look at this equation, you might see that it looks pretty familiar because it's actually just a photosynthesis equation, but uh, switched around. It's glucose plus oxygen becomes carbon dioxide and water and energy stored in ATP. So um, what happens? is there are three stages. The first one is going to be glycolysis. This occurs in the cytoplasm and it's an anaerobic process, which means it doesn't need oxygen to occur. It starts with glucose and ends with pyruvic acid and it uses four ATP produces, sorry, um, these slides are wrong. It doesn't use four. Um, it uses two and produces four, should switch that, and you get a net gain of two ATP. However, this is actually not the place where, um, this is not the place where most ATP is formed, that is in the electron transport chain. All right, fermentation can take place after glycolysis if there is a lack of oxygen due to the next two stages being aerobic um, processes, which means that they need oxygen. Um, it occurs in the cytoplasm of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. All right, can we move to the next slide? Oh, it's going really slowly. Okay, um, this is just a list of the things that are formed through the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. You don't really need to know anything past the input and the output of each stage, and also if they're aerobic or anaerobic. So you can either uh, write these down or take a screenshot because we're going to move on to the next slide. Okay, this is the electron transport chain. And this is a short summary of what happens. Basically, most of the ATP is produced here. Um, yeah. The next slide shows the totals. So uh, could you move to the next slide, please? These are the totals for each uh, stage of cellular respiration. Please note that the electron transport chain doesn't always produce 32 ATP per glucose. It can vary depending, uh, it can vary, yeah. All right, can we move on to the next slide? We have two minutes left to get through cellular division and some miscellaneous. It's a bit over time, it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Oh, all right, that's fine. Okay, so, um, <laughs> mitosis, yeah. So basically what you're, they're, you're going to be asked on this section is uh, they're going to show you a picture and ask you, oh, what stage of the, what stage of cellular division is this? 
And uh, that's why it's useful to have some diagrams as we've shown here. So um, hang on for a second. I need to find my notes for this section. All right, so we're going to go through mitosis first. Oh, what's happening in the chat? Oh yeah, Amoeba Sisters is a really, Amoeba Sisters is a good tool or good video. They have really good videos. I binged them right before my biology final last year. All right, mitosis is the process of division of the nucleus. It is not cell division. Cell division happens right after mitosis. There's four or five phases. Um, we're not going to cover the fifth phase because it's not very tested, but there's prophase and then prometaphase, not usually, that, that, that's the fifth phase that we don't usually talk about. Then metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, followed by cytokinesis or cell division. All right, so in prophase, the nuclear envelope disappears and the nucleolus also disappears. The chromosomes condense and become visible and the mitotic spindle begins to form. The mitotic spindle is the structure responsible for organizing mitosis. It consists of microtubules. So basically what happens is kinetochore microtubules attach to the kinetochore and each sister chromatid attaches to fibers from opposite sides. All right, and next we have metaphase. Metaphase is when all of the, um, metaphase is the pulling of the kinetic core fibers. It basically lines all the chromosomes up in the center. So if you see a bunch of chromosomes lined up together in the um, first row, fourth column, that photo, um, that's metaphase. There is a spindle checkpoint here which helps check that all sister chromatids are properly attached before anaphase. All right, anaphase is when the chromosomes are being pulled apart. In early anaphase, the centromeres are split. Half the chromosomes move to one pole and half to the other pole. So um, you see, basically, if the Sister chromatids are still attached to the kinetic core fibers, but they're, they've already been pulled apart. It's probably anaphase. And in telophase, it's the reverse of prophase, basically. The chromosomes return to chromatin, diffused, and the nuclear envelope reforms, as well as the nucleolus. This often overlaps with cytokinesis in diagrams. And uh, cytokinesis is yeah, cell division. Usually what happens is there's an actin ring or a contractile ring that pinches a cell and forms a cleavage furrow between the cells to cut it apart. Yeah, too much mitosis is harmful for the body. Uh, cancer is the unchecked replication of cells. All right, we can move on to the next slide. All right, this is meiosis. Uh, meiosis is like mitosis, but doubled. So you go through the first section, the prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, then cytokinesis. And then between two of the cells, they uh, each of them goes through prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, and cytokinesis two. I know I said that like five times. What you need to know for this section is um, one, um, diploid cell becomes four haploid cells. That's, yeah, that's basically it, I think. All right, we're actually almost done. So next up we have genetics. Genetics is pretty complicated and because I figured we would run out of time, uh, we're not covering it. It's a pretty big part of um, bioprocess lab but unfortunately I am unable to explain it in five minutes. 
So I have put some vocabulary words up and um, linked a Science Olympiad link. So basically, there's another event that is called Heredity in Science Olympiad that basically covers everything that you need to know in this section. I looked at the website and explains everything really well. So you can probably learn from there. They also have, you can use their past tests as practice problems for this section. What you need to do is be able to draw and understand how to use Punnett squares and understand pedigrees. All right, yeah. Um, so how many events can you do in Science Olympiad? Um, usually at our school, we usually do um, three to five events. It depends on how much time you have. Five events are a lot. And um, yeah, I believe you can have a maximum of 15 people on the team. So unless you don't have enough people, you're going to be doing about that number of events. Uh, Punnett squares are, um, Punnett squares are an easier way to cross um, the allows of um, different organisms to figure out their what their offspring would have. How many events are recommended for Science Olympiad? Also still about three to five. Um, if you have too many, you can't focus on them all. Okay, so miscellaneous is basically just everything we haven't covered before. Usually there is a question that asks you to design an experiment for Science Olympiad. So what you need to know is the scientific process, how to write a hypothesis, uh, usually use um, if this, then this, because this, and um, it lists independent variables and dependent variables. There should be only one in each experiment. And um, constants, you should list at least three. Polymers and macromolecules aren't tested a lot, but it depends on which test you have. If you're participating in bird SO, usually they have a lot of questions about a wide variety of topics, so it's nice to know. Um, yeah, these are just basic vocabulary terms. All right. And as for acids, bases, and indicators, acids and bases, um, Okay, so acids and bases, you should know a basic definition of it. And oftentimes what you're going to have are a bunch of pH indicators. So um, usually, I believe they've changed it to in-person contests now. So usually what they're going to do is they're going to give you a solution and like some litmus paper and it's like um, approximate the pH of this thing. And they give you like this sheet to go off of. Some other useful stuff is no Benedict solution, Lugol's iodine, Burit solution, and bromothymol blue and red cabbage. Know what each of these um, do. pH can value between zero and um, 14. The higher the value, the more basic the solution is. Yeah, water is usually around seven. Okay, yeah, that's all I have today for this. So um, uh, we're going to um, go so into a break. The, mm -hmm. For the DNA thing, I have like this science book and I'm not sure if this is related, but... Um, uh, you have your background blurred. I can't see anything oh. on your screen. Oh yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier with the um, Punnett squares. Usually when you're using Punnett squares, you're going to cross these alleles. So you have the dominant allele and the recessive allele. The dominant allele is sh always shown and the recessive allele is only shown when, um, uh, only shown when there are no dominant alleles. What they're seeing there with the piece is Mendelian genetics. Um, he, he, raised a bunch of peas and carefully crossed different variants to um, get his final conclusions. Genotypes are the um, genotypes are the traits that are shown and the phenotypes are the ones that are just um, that are okay so um, 
if you had like one dominant allele, one recessive, and it was normal, um, the genotype would be, yeah, genotype is what is shown. The phenotype is the actual like knowledge that there is one recessive. Okay, yeah. So we're gonna go on a 10 minute break and return at five o'clock. So thank you everyone. And we're gonna be doing a Kahoot probably if I can get it working when we get back. If I can't get it to work, we may not be doing the Kahoot. I can host the Kahoot and I will go back to play the photosynthesis video that was not shown. All right, thank you. In order for plants to grow, they need inputs of carbon dioxide, water, and energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. The energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles, or photons, are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path, which is measured as wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths, called the electromagnetic spectrum. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems, called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem 2 first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, 
low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. The Calvin cycle consists of a series of reactions that reduce carbon dioxide to produce the carbohydrate glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The cycle consists of three steps, the first of which is carbon fixation. In this step, carbon dioxide is attached to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, resulting in a 6-carbon molecule that splits into two 3-carbon molecules. The second step is a sequence of reactions using electrons from NADPH and some of the ATP to reduce carbon dioxide. In the final step, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is regenerated. For every three turns of the cycle, five molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are used to reform three molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. The remaining glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then used to make glucose, fatty acids, or glycerol. It takes two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make one molecule of glucose phosphate. Thus, the Calvin cycle has to run six times to produce one molecule of glucose. These molecules can remove their phosphate and add fructose to form sucrose, the molecule plants use to transport carbohydrates throughout their system. Glucose phosphate is also the starting molecule for the synthesis of starch and cellulose. Plants produce sugars to use as storage molecules and structural components for their own benefit. By utilizing the energy of the sun, along with inputs of water and carbon dioxide, plants act as glucose factories. Photosynthetic organisms are the primary producers of glucose on the planet. They also produce oxygen gas as a byproduct and thus serve as the foundation of life, providing food and oxygen for the complex food webs on both land and in the oceans.